so good morning, good afternoon, folks. We've got classes joining us from across North America, and welcome into another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces today, but if you are new to what we do, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, counterintuitively, back in February, we ran an epic series of programs all around the amazing March Mammal Madness outreach campaign. If you guys aren't familiar with March Mammal Madness, you probably wouldn't have participated this year, but next year, March Mammal Madness is the single coolest, most amazing program I've ever had the chance to feature on this broadcast. We did a seven part series. You can check all those sessions out on our YouTube channel, featuring scientists, illustrators, amazing people from around the world, dedicated to sharing their love of nature with kids like you. So since that happened, it was such a cool program, I've had to invite on the best of the best back on to our programs for individual one-off broadcasts. So we were joined recently by Alison Brokaw talking about bats. We had Christy Luton on talking about human evolution, some really cool stuff, but I am most excited for today's program. I've got to say, don't tell Alison and Christy because we have on Karen Henning and she is an amazing illustrator, the lead illustrator behind the March Mail Madness campaign. You can see a ton of her incredible artwork on her website at the bottom of the screen. I'll make sure all our classes have that as well throughout the broadcast. But today we're going to be joined by her to learn a little bit about scientific storytelling through art. Now for me, a stick person is the most that I can do with a pen and paper. Maybe today I'll, I'll learn a little more and get a little better. But Karen is going to showcase her process, tell us a little bit about how she tells stories through art, and we're going to do a little bit of a live demo together. So if you guys are excited, I certainly am. And without further ado, Karen, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. Thank you so much for having me back, Jesse. I had such a great time for the March Mammal Madness Festival, and I'm really, really excited to be back to talk a little bit more about science art and visual science communication and the importance of storytelling in science. Um, would you like me to begin by sharing some of the work that I have done to explain a little bit about what I do and, and what my favorite materials are? Ooh, favorite materials. I didn't know that was going to be a part of it. So yes, please do share away. I'd love to see some of your stuff. And show okay, <laughs> let me share screen. Ooh, look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> this is a two-time, I believe two-time, maybe three-time, but definitely two-time March Mammal Madness contestant uh, called a Tiger Qual. And he is rendered in graphite, prismacolor, and gel pen. So where you see the very, very distinct sharp-edged white, that's a gel pen. And I use that for things like highlights and uh, basically things that are shiny or have a hard edge on them, like the teeth. Um, and for fur, I use the prismacolor to do the white spots. And when you're drawing an animal like this, the, uh, the pose, can be very important because you need to communicate that even though this guy is fierce, he is relatively small. And you can tell that by the relation of the size of the head and the mouth to the feet and to the body. So somebody like this, we're a little bit farther away. You can tell again by the relation of the size of the eyes to the head and the ears and then the shoulders coming up behind that this is a larger animal. But again, the more intense white gel pen, the softer white prismacolors, and the, the shades of gray are graphite. This is one of my favorite combinations to use. The gray color comes from the paper. It's toned paper. Very, very easy to find. Um, if your local art store does not carry toned paper, you can use recycled grocery bags, paper grocery bags, which I did for a number of years because it's a nice warm brown, which is similar to what I used for our tiger quoll. Now, sometimes you want to tell more of a story about the animal. This is an Aninga, also known as a darter or a snake bird. They live at tropical latitudes. Um, this particular guy I photographed in one of the parks in Florida. And when you want to show where they live, which can inform why they look the way they do and behave the way they do, it's important to include a number of elements that will, will give you a full picture. So we have the log in front, the dead log, um, on which he's perched. We have the 
pampas grass, we have the duckweed on the surface of the water, and then we have the various species of palms in the background, and even a little bit of Spanish moss up in the left-hand corner. And the behavior that he is displaying is something he has to do to dry his wings. Uh, he is not like a duck um, where he floats because he has oil in his feathers. Because he hunts underwater, he cannot afford to float. He needs the energy to move around underwater to find his food. So his feathers absorb the water, kind of like a sponge or blotting paper. And as a result, he has to climb out of the water after a few minutes or so, so he doesn't get chilled and spread his wings to dry out in the sun. And it's a really iconic image that you see in most places from Florida to Texas. And um, it's the, the feathers are, are were just so beautiful that uh, when I was tasked with this particular animal and habitat project, this is the one that I went with. This is the same material, but this is telling a very different kind of story. This is more to convey information um, rather than about where the animal lives and what habitat it lives in. What we're looking at here is the structure of the skull and in particular, the teeth. You'll notice that the teeth on this clouded leopard are incredibly large. They have the largest canine to skull ratio in terms of size of any living cat today. They are the closest thing we have today to a saber-toothed cat. And if you compare the shape of their skull to that of saber-tooths, uh, and you can find pictures of these online. You can you can go to museums and look at them. You will find the structure of that is very, very similar. This is a species of cat that's been around for a very, very long time. Jesse, should I stop here and uh, take questions or? You know what? If you want to keep going and share even more, it's fantastic. I do want to know, we've got some big fans of yours on YouTube as well. So we've got Miss Dennison's class with Brody, who is the student tournament winner. We've got folks who are like really familiar with your work. So we've got some huge fans, which is very exciting. So welcome in Miss Dennison's group as well. So wonderful. Uh, it's up to you. I mean, we can start taking questions about some of your artwork, some of the strategies students have. I know we've got groups today joining everywhere from, I think, grade three through grade seven. So if classes do have any queries for you about maybe the way that they've drawn things or how they would go about painting some new things, um, feel free to share that in the chat. We can come to them live in a little bit. But I'm curious to begin uh, a question of my own. When you go about picking things to draw, is it when you, when you started, when you were the age of some of our students today, did you have a sketchbook? How did you go about making art? Was there anything, any special tricks for a person who ended up in this career that our students today could sort of take home with? I have been drawing literally since I could hold a pencil. I come <laughs> by it honestly. I have artists on both sides of my family. We have oil paintings that were created by my grandfather hanging on the walls of the house. And um, I'm very excited because I'm about to move into a, a, a new home of my own. And I now have wall space where I can hang some of those paintings. And that is gonna be very special um, because not only is it beautiful art, it's beautiful art that's related directly to me. And um, it's part of what made me who I am and, and got me here. Yeah. Um, but really, there is something to be said for taking a small sketchbook and it doesn't need to be big. It can just be yeah. about that big and a pencil or a pen, something to write with or draw with and start making notes about things that are around you that are interesting. I will go to museums, parks, um, even to uh, little tourist towns that have really fascinating architecture. And I'll make the time, if it's just half an hour or 40 minutes, to draw what looks interesting, what is different from where it is that I live and spend the most of my time. Yeah. So we have. We do. I'm going to head to them in just a quick second. So classes, you guys can start sharing, just letting me know that you have a question. I'll come to you live in the chat and just momentarily. I'm curious when you started. So for me, as I said, I've never been a good artist. I've never spent the time to become a good artist, which might be a big part of it. But were you always really good? Or when you were as young as the students in the classes today, were you just okay? Like if people wanted to get into art in a serious way, or even if they just wanted to do it as a hobby, is there a way you'd recommend of building up that skill over time? 
There are so many resources out there today with the internet. I did not grow up with internet resources. Um, I took lessons from professionals in my area, so it was person to person. Um, but there are a lot of really good resources, free resources out there uh, on places like YouTube. If you want to learn specifically about things like nature journaling, wildlife art, uh, John Muir's Law, has a lot of free resources on his site. He uh, runs the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference each year. Ooh. And he, like you, Jesse, his passion is just getting people out in nature to interact and find their place in it. And one of the best ways he's found to do that is to, to draw. Yeah. It helps with understanding as to why things look the way that they do. And awesome, that's great. Yeah. Um, and uh, lots of free resources on that site and links to other people who also have free classes and resources on their sites. Um, it's the thing about wildlife and science artists is we tend to be very, very generous with what we know because we are super excited about it and we want other people who are interested to also be super excited about it. And probably one of the most useful things I can tell to young artists starting out is you got to think it, of it like levels in video games. If you're at level one or two, you're just starting out that game and you're, you're learning the game, you're learning the world, you're learning the skills that you need. So by the time you get to level 45 or 50, you're pretty good at that game, but you didn't come in as a level 50. Right. So if you're 12 years old, 15 years old, 16 years old, you're a level 12, 15, 16 artist. Yeah. As of this year, I am a level 50 artist. So <laughs> the thing is, you cannot compare what you are doing at level one or two in a video game to those who are at level 50 any more than you can compare your artwork at level 12 or 15 to what I'm at at 49 or 50. Okay. So what you want to do is find other artists who are within that level, plus or minus three or four levels, see what they're doing, and reach out. As I said, we tend to be very, very generous with, with what we know. And as long as you reach out and are polite, we will be happy to interact with you and share what information you're seeking. I'm so glad you mentioned this and emphasize it. Now we hear this in the scientific context quite a bit, but I, I always tell students, we get this question all the time. Like if I want to get into something, how do I go about it? Reach out, ask. Most people won't bite. And the people that do, you don't want to be working with anyway. Like the people we're we're all such passionate individuals in exploring by the seat of your pants the realm that we're, the speakers are bringing in and so you'll find that you'll have a, a really good time if you just reach out and find out what you can learn and find out how you can get involved again as you keep mentioning sites and resources i'll make sure all our classes have those at the end of the broadcast as well perfect thank uh, let's you start with some questions we've got uh, at least one from each class plus a couple on youtube already so a great start to this so vicky miss nedko's class at cedar view in ottawa today if you guys want to kick us off with one come on in and Take us away. Hey, guys. My question is, what made you want to continue drawing? Because a lot of people give up drawing throughout yeah. their life, especially when looking for a new job. Yeah, great question. That is something that has continually brought me joy. In the times that it um, was stressful, those are the times that I found myself comparing myself to other artists who are doing things in different ways and have different resources and different skill sets are in, and are at that different level. Um, so it's usually stress with art never comes from the art that you're making. It comes from comparing the art that you're making with what other people are doing. Um, which is generally not useful or helpful unless you are actively learning from that person and seeking advice from them. Um, so what made me continue was the, the, the real joy in immersion. I have a very, very distinct memory. I was doing work in a museum in 2014 and I was plugged in. I had my music going and I was working on a cast of a Tyrannosaur skull. And the combination of being in that museum environment, drawing that particular animal and having music that I really loved. I, 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 I mean, I'm getting really emotional just reliving this. It was such a source of pure bliss. And that when you're in flow and you're doing work that you love artistically, 
Um, there's just nothing else like it. What a beautiful answer. We can talk about flow a little later too. I was gonna. I was wondering if you were gonna bring it up during today's broadcast. It's exciting. Um, we'll make sure we, we highlight that. But for now, we'll head to Mr. Marker's class, joining us in Sudbury. If you guys have one for us, come on in. Hey guys. Hi, I'm Jane. Hi. And do you do you only draw animals, or do you draw anything else? I draw pretty much anything that they ask me to draw. Um, I love the animals and, and plants are my favorites. I am starting to learn more about plants. I feel like I don't know enough about plants to really do them justice right now. <laughs> One of my uh, housemates is a, a huge fan of plants. So I am by default having to, to learn plants because she's giving us a lot of babies. So I'll have subject matter in my own home to, to learn how to draw. Um, when I'm not drawing animals, I'm usually drawing their bones. Um, that is something that I get asked to do quite a bit, especially by paleontologists and people who work with uh, fossilized remains. Um, I love working with bones because you can clearly see where we as, as a human species got inspired to do the kind of architecture that we do because all of those structures, arches and columns and pillars and things that connect in the way that they do, uh, nature did all that first within the bone structure of uh, vertebrate tetrapods. So, yeah, what a, a neat analogy. I've never heard that in anything you've ever done. That's fantastic. Um, Ms. Becker, I'm going to come to you guys in two quick seconds. We've got two separate teachers on YouTube asking this. So Ms. Dennison and Ms. Riley want to know how long it takes you to complete a piece. So this, I know the answer is it depends, but a rough idea of if you're drawing an animal or if you're drawing a skeleton, how long does it take? If I am doing a piece for March Mammal Madness um, and I have nothing else on the slate for that day, which I, I try to clear the slate from mid-February to mid-April for that purpose, um, I can do a digital rendering in about two to four hours. Wow. Um, wow. Of the stuff that I showed earlier, the, the tiger quoll and the leopard and the, um, the aninga, um, those took anywhere between seven to 12 hours a piece. Okay. Um, there is something about digital and being able to go back three or four steps with the touch of a button that makes it move much, much faster than when you're working with traditional media, where the consideration of what mark to make next and how bold and where, um, is a much more nuanced and considered decision because uh, the erasers for traditional media just are not as effective as being mm. able to hit that back and undo button. Yeah. Um, I think digital gives you a lot more freedom to, to play around and, and, and make mistakes. And I, I use that phrase very loosely because um, I, don't, I don't really think there are mistakes being made if something doesn't look quite the way that you you think it should um it, it it can lead you down different paths and different little rabbit holes that uh maybe you wouldn't have gotten to if it looked the way you think it should look um so so and even in traditional media go forward be bold make all of those marks because you can always come back later with a piece of tracing paper, especially on traditional media, and redo it and try different things, see what it looks like without that line, or maybe with a few more lines over here. You took a, a simple question, you turned it into this beautiful answer. I love it. This is the essence of talking to an, art, an artist here. Um, let's head to Ms. Becker's group in San Diego, and then we'll take a few more from YouTube before diving in with that demo. So Ms. Becker's class, come on in. Hey, guys. When did you start to like drawing and when did you decide to like, you want to continue doing it and be good at it? I've been drawing literally since I could hold a pencil. Whenever I was asked through uh, grade school, what do you want to be when you grow up? The answer was always an artist. It wasn't until I got to about middle school that I had very well-meaning but misguided adults tell me, well, maybe you should consider doing something that's a little more sensible. And it, it just, it never occurred to me that doing art was something that was not sensible or, or, or workable because I knew plenty of people who were making a good living as, as artists and, and 
in my house growing up, because I came from a family that had artists on both sides, we never had the the, the myth of the starving artist shared with us. My, my brother has a great career in the performing arts, um, and neither he or I ever heard, well, maybe you should use this as a hobby and, and, and consider something sensible for a career. We were encouraged from day one, and I, I know now how incredibly uh, privileged and uh, that we were and how unusual that is. Um, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, even if you have people telling you that it's not sensible or realistic to make a living as an artist, you're going to work a little harder to do it, but you're going to be working at something that you love on your terms and you're going to be doing better work because you have the passion behind it to do it. Um, and it wasn't until high school I had uh, an art instructor who literally helped me stru structure my schedule. By the time I was a senior in high school, half of my school day was spent doing independent study courses in her class. And I realize now, looking back, she was teaching me project management. I could do whatever I wanted. I just needed to bring her an agenda of what I was doing, how I was going to do it, and what my schedule was, I, I had to set deadlines for myself. So she not only was teaching me art and giving me the opportunities to do the stuff I really enjoyed doing, she was teaching me how to structure it as, as a project, um, which has since helped me write proposals um, because I, I had to bring all of that information to her. Yeah. So um, if she had told me, oh, we're gonna teach you project management, I probably would have backpedaled really fast yeah. but because she wasn't presented in that way. It yeah. ended up sticking in a way that it probably wouldn't have if it had been presented as anything other than, well, make the art that you want. This is the Mr. Miyagi story, which uh, yeah. in so many of our programs, and, and as a reference, by the way, is over the head of every single kid in today's program. Um, that's, you know what? So much of your program so far has been focused on the importance of learning and taking inspiration for people in your life. And I love these sort of two quasi-related questions from some of our teachers on YouTube. So Miss Stevens wants to know if you have a favorite artist uh, in the world that you take inspiration from, and Miss Hoffs, and this might be the same person, uh, a student in Miss Hoffs' class, do you have a biggest inspiration? So a favorite artist or a biggest inspiration, maybe both the same thing. Wow, uh, there are so many artists whose work I am fond of. Uh, in, in sculpture, it is probably Beth Kavanagh, who uh, does work around wildlife, but she focuses very specifically on elongating limbs and curved shapes in those animals uh, that makes it uh, elegant and, and slightly otherworldly. It's there, there's kind of an Alice in Wonderland feel about some of her animals, but they're accurate. You can tell immediately what they are, and they're, they're just very, very beautiful to look at. Josie Morway is a an oil painter out west. Um, she does really interesting compositions that involve uh, text elements, plants, and wildlife, and uh, does a lot of work uh, with strong statements about uh, climate change, environmentalism, and how we as people interact with the natural world and the good and the bad that we do to it. John Ching is another artist whose work I really love because he will take shapes that are similar in nature, like the crest on a bird's head, and he will look at other shapes that are close to that, like uh, a mushroom fungus on a tree. Um, and those things are very similarly shaped, so he'll combine them into one painting of that particular mushroom fungus and the bird as one entity. And it's, it is, it's whimsical and delightful and incredibly detailed. And I just, I love everything about it. In terms of what inspires me outside of, of other artists, yeah. um, open the door, step outside. That's it. So for real and no kidding. You, um, uh, oh, it wants to work for me. There we go. A couple things. I, just so our classes have this and for posterity, for anyone who watches this broadcast in the future, I found the websites and saw some of the artists who were talking with this. So Beth Kavanagh is at followtheblackrabbit.com. Josie Morway, simple name, just like your website. And John Ching Art, uh, com. Amazing. Like these are really unbelievable. Again, 
every time I see great art, it really excites me because it's so beyond anything that I, I sort of instinctually could create myself or think that I could create myself, and, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but it's so <laughs> incredible, these different visions of things where you can take the same creature or the same idea and do it in so many different ways that evoke such a different response. It's so beautiful. Um, and so I, I do encourage our classes to check out those amazing artists. And you mentioned getting outdoors. I will say in advance, we've got a couple days left till it gets underway officially, but Backyard Bio is starting up in May. We've got uh, teachers on seven countries in four colleges continents already registered to connect with one another around the world around a shared love of wildlife so hashtag backyard bio i naturals get out enjoy now we we do talk a lot about pictures in that campaign but if you want to draw if you want to sketch i um, mean if karen's inspiring you like she is me i'm i'd love to see what you guys come up with for that uh in the month to come so do check that out uh guys there's so many great questions there's actually too many questions coming in for me to possibly <laughs> take one broadcast which is a good problem to have uh, Miss Lilith's class, Burnthorpe Public School, wants to know, uh, is there, have you ever made an art piece that took a whole day to make, beyond that seven to ten hours? Oof. I've worked on pieces that have taken me more than one day to make. Um, I have pieces that have taken me uh, three, four, five days yeah. to make. Um, generally, those pieces are larger. They're talking 20 by 15 inches. Um, and they're in traditional media, probably more than one medium. Um, I have a piece in my portfolio that is one of those pieces. And did, could, I, could I bring that one up, Chelsea? Yeah, please bring it up. Okay? You're All one. Right. This is your show. I just get to be excited. Let me get to that and bring it on up. There it is. Share the screen. See, the anticipation builds so much. Look at this. Oh, cool. So that was a callback to, um, and I'm dating myself again here. Uh, there were uh, school photos that were taken back in the 80s that had uh, um, the, the person in the lower right quadrant, and then they would have um, kind of a, a, a faded out version of, of their face in a three quarter view kind of looming in from space in the background. So this was my take on that. It's an Americana chicken and with it, with its alter ego, uh, IE close relative, the T-Rex in the, uh, in the background behind and the skull is done in graphite. And the chicken is a mixture of watercolor gouache and colored pencil. And I worked on this for a number of weeks uh, before I got it to a point where I really felt like it was completed. Yeah, it's stunning. I just love it. Uh, this is actually, while this is up, and, and before we dive in with, with an illustration demo with our students and you together, uh, one last question I love. So Liam asked, this is Miss McGrath's class, would you be willing to share what drawing software you use when drawing digitally? Because you, you talked about the uh, amazing ability to sort of go back and, and tailor things and play around and be willing to, able to make mistakes with this. And so what's the, what do you use if you're willing to share? I am using the iPad Pro and I'm using a program called Procreate, which has consistently been $10 to purchase. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, I know artists that I've been working alongside for years who have stopped using Photoshop in favor of using Procreate. Um, if you are not Mac based or do not have an iPad, every once in a while, Clip Studio Paint, which is a program that I believe runs on both platforms, uh, will come up for sale for $25, $30. Incredibly powerful, powerful program. Yeah. And um, it was actually my uh, the, the rest of my team, the art team and March Mammal Madness, who had turned me on to that. Um, and I'm just getting into exploring it because it is a lot incredibly powerful interface. Um, and I'm still not using the uh, the whole interface on Procreate. Again, for both of these, there are a lot of free resources out there to help you learn how to to use them. Um, and to help make your work look like the work of artists who you admire. And um, one caveat, <laughs> look at artists whose work inspires you. Yes. If their work is, is making you feel uncomfortable or, or bad about yourself, stop looking at it. <laughs> go and look at work that makes you go, oh, yeah, that's really cool. I want to do that. And look at that more often because that's what we're trying to do. Look at art that builds you up. 
That's a beautiful message. I'm so glad you uh, the, the cheat thing is really important. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think a lot of us assume to do great work takes really expensive tools. I think we're sort of that's drilled into us and that is simply not the case. I mean, and again, you talked about the fact that you started with a sketch pad and everyone can begin with that. I mean, it, it's for a dollar at any dollar store, you can get a pencil and a sketch pad and you can make really beautiful things on the path to becoming a level 50 artist like Karen. Absolutely. Well, speaking of becoming an artist like you, I would love if we dive with a little bit of a demo together. We can have our students uh, join along in, in our classrooms live and on YouTube. And then at the end, if we've got time for some additional questions and people want to share what they've drawn, all the better. Okay. So I will once again share my Take screen. Take three. <laughs> do to do. Thank you so much for being the sort of person that says do to do while you get things up. I appreciate you so <laughs> That's much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what I do. So, okay. So say hello to the burrowing owl. Um, these guys live underground. And um, I, I love these guys because you can clearly see their legs, which is not something you can see a lot in other owls because there are feathers covering them. Um, kind of like uh, long petticoats and, and skirts. Um, that you see in Victorian etchings that the, the women wear. But these guys have, have their legs relatively free because they dig with them and they live on the ground. They don't fly very often. They run around on the ground. Um, I first got to know these guys by drawing them. Um, I was at a conference for illustrators. Uh, the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators has an annual conference and uh, one of the workshops was with uh, Linda Feltner, who is a renowned bird artist and just lovely, lovely human being. Again, one of those people who is very, very generous and, and loves to share what she knows. And she had arranged with a couple of rescues and uh, raptor rehabs to bring in several species so that we could bring in our sketchbooks and draw them. And she made the rounds of the room giving advice on how we should best approach that. So this guy was one of my favorites. I'm going to just turn down the contrast on that a little bit. Because one of the things about starting to draw anything, it is very tempting to kind of start with this area here and draw that brow, that eye, the feathers up here, and then kind of work your way down. But the problem is by the time you get down here, nothing over here is going to match in the area that you are at down here. So instead of looking at the details, there's that undo function I love so well. Instead of looking at the details, what you wanna do is look at the shape. So the shape of this guy, we have kind of an egg shape right there for the body. And with the wings, we kind of have lines here. And then for the head up top, we kind of have this kind of shape, kind of a UFO shape. And then we have this shape here. Okay, so we have those shapes that we're working on. And I realized in the middle of drawing this guy that really what he actually looks like is a coffee can with a motorcycle helmet. That is what an owl looks like. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to show you a picture of another owl. His head is a little tilted, but you can clearly see that coffee can shape, which is right here. You get on the right layer, that coffee can shape there, and the motorcycle helmet there. So looking at the shape then allows you to go in and start picking out some of those details. Now there's another way that you can pick out shape, and that instead of looking at this shape, in here. So instead of looking at all of this, whoop, instead of looking at this shape in here, you can look at all of this out here. And if you draw this, the line around the owl, 
what you're doing is you're you're drawing the the negative space, which is especially useful for things like this shape here and this shape here. Okay, so you're looking at this rather than the shape of the leg. Okay, that is the best and most useful information that I can give all of you for getting started on drawing anything out there. If you look for that shape first and then go in and start looking at the details, that will go so far towards improving the work that you do in terms of how you look at it and, and perceive it as being accurate than anything else that you can do. Now, the other thing that you can do, let me see if I can, well, let me fade him out again. Because the other thing that I look at in terms of shape is, let me bring that shape back. So what is the relation between this distance and this distance okay and then what is this distance now the way when i am outside in nature or if i'm observing this little guy on somebody's glove i will use parts of my finger you you've probably seen the stereotypical picture of the artist standing at the easel with their arm outstretched with their thumb up that is what they are doing is they are using their thumb as a measuring device. And then you can bring it back towards you and putting it over the shapes that you have made on the paper, you can determine if the measurements and the distances between those shapes and in those shapes are, are accurate. And you can do that with all of the shapes in all portions. So shape and measurement that, I mean, you're already light years ahead of where I was at your age with this information. So using that as a foundation, I would absolutely love any questions from that point that would help you understand better how to utilize that um and how to get to those points and to get those points to a drawing yeah well we are going to dive in with the last little bit of question period here we got five or so minutes before we wrap up time flies and you're having fun when you're having a great time talking about all these great things by the way i want to note i have my first owl with my helmet and my coffee can i thought that was very helpful and there you go. Like, he's very, he's very broody looking at the bottom. Now this is with my my black pen by myself, which is better than I used to do. So I, I you've already got me on a, a good path. Classes, if you do have any questions about uh, Karen's artistic process, anything you'd like to ask specifically about that, or dive in, I'd love to hear it. And of course, after the broadcast too, if you want to get me questions, we can try and get you those answers as soon as we can. So Mr. Marker's class. Oh, you did have a student just run in and take a seat. Uh, <laughs> if you have a question for us, or come on in. Challen just wants to show off her sketch that she did with Oh, yes, please. Hey. Hi, um, Hi. I'm Shalyn, and this is what I drew. And nice. there he is. That's awesome. That was that was better than my first burrowing owl before Linda came and looked over my shoulder and said, you need to think about this and this first. So yes. you have clearly done that, and I could tell immediately what species that was because of that. So well done. And you draw it through the little, like the actual measurements, which is a fantastic tool, right? Like, and again, you can certainly digitally, you can get rid of those after the fact. You saw Karen do that really, really fast with the software that she has. But if you have a pen and pencil or paper or pencil and eraser, you can sketch that in, erase that out, do those greater details. So great job, guys. All right. Um, you can also question. put a piece of tracing paper over your drawing and keep the elements that you want on that piece of tracing paper and then continue on that. Amazing. And don't be like me and tear all the tracing paper that you were ever given <laughs> as a boy for many, many years uh, to the point where you give up. You've got to be more delicate than I was. Um, Ms. Becker's class, uh, if you guys have one for us or a question or want to show something off, come on in. Hey, guys. 
They're too busy drawing, Karen, is the thing. Well, more power to them. A good problem to have. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you guys in this backers group. In Cedar View, if you guys have a question or want to share anything or, or come in, uh, by all means, go for it. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. Do you have any questions or are you just having too much fun drawing? Guys, questions? One question, come on up, take your time, you're good. Hey. Um, I was just wondering, like, when you have to draw, like, the feathers and stuff, or, like, when you draw um, an owl, can you use, like, different kinds of, like, pens and stuff? Like, do you have recommendations? Mm. Um, you can. Basically, when you're trying to represent any um, anything that you're drawing, um, you can use the same tool to represent all of that. Um, the, the questions that I use to help me figure out what decisions to make in terms of what, what kinds of lines to use, um, I will, in order to get to things like the, the coffee can motorcycle helmet answer, I look at the shapes and ask, what does it remind me of? What does it look like? What does it remind me of? Um, and with feathers, sometimes those can look like like fur. Sometimes it can look like sawdust. Sometimes they can be really long and silky and look like hair. And some of those things, even though I, I don't have an owl standing on my desk in front of me to give me a good look at their feathers, I generally will find something around the house or in in a way that I'm able to, uh, to, to bring in to look at directly um, under the category of what does this remind me of? What does it look like to me? Um, and again, then you're looking at the shapes, then you're looking at which way the lines move. Um, and it's all going to be lines next to each other or overlapping or lines making shapes. Those are your options. And looking at the way things like feathers move and grow uh, in, on the owl's head, the feathers on the forehead tend to move out like this. So if you draw small lines that move out in that direction, you are going to effectively mimic the look of those feathers on, on the paper. Fantastic. All right. We've got time for one more question. So I want to note for our students, I know you guys are busy drawing and that is amazing. Like that's honestly where we wanted to leave you at the end of this broadcast. And Karen, I want to say thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll say a big farewell in just a minute. If you guys want to share your pictures, you can email them to us at exploring by the seat your pants or initials at gmail.com. All your teachers have these, or you can tag us or Karen on social media. We'd love to see your owl images. Or if you if you went rogue and decided to draw an anhinga or a coal, which by the way, great ideas for those animals to share, by the way. I appreciate you so much for the unique creatures. Uh, share any drawings you have or share questions, tips, anything that you guys learn in the, in the day to come. We'd love to hear that. But I want to wrap up with one last question from Mr. Margaret, student patiently oh, waiting oh, for the camera. Hey, grade fours. Oh. <laughs> she said she wants to hear your question. Go. Yeah, we're excited. I was wondering what type of Apple Pencil you use for your digital art. Ooh. Is the um, the Generation 2 Apple Pencil that has the magnetic strip on it that helps it charge. Yeah, I love that a grade 4 student asked that question. You guys are so much more adept at all this than any of us are. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> Aaron, this has been so much fun. Again, I want to stress for all our students that are keen, if you want to feed, see some of the people that inspired Karen, follow the Black Rabbit, josiemorway.com, John Ching Art. If you want to see some of the tools that she uses for her amazing work, Procreate on the iPad, Clip Studio Paint, check out the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, which is an amazing platform. And we talked about John Muir Laws at the beginning of the program as well. But of course, more than anything, head to Karen's website if you want to see more of her amazing art. And it is so spectacular. Honestly, March Mammal Madness, the best part of it. I love it all. I love you, Katie, if you're watching this. Your art was my favorite thing. It's the best thing ever. Um, so check out her work on social media, on her website, and more. Uh, is there any final message before we bring in our kids to say thank you and farewell? that we want to leave our classes with today. Draw on. Draw <laughs> on.
<laughs> Couldn't be worse than that. I love it. Uh, Mr. Margaret Mace Becker, Vicky, it's interview. If you guys want to join in and say a big thank you and farewell, you are all good to go. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank Have you. a wonderful day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.